Okay, uh, so this is the review session for EGME 407, uh, heat transfer for the first midterm. Okay. All right, so I, I looked at the poll results on uh, Canvas, and these are the top three results. So number one on the list was transient conduction, uh, number two was fins, and three was radial heat transfer. Right. And so, uh, and so for about the next hour, maybe a little bit over an hour, um, I'll be going over um, each of these. I'll, I'll definitely get through transient conduction and fins. Um, and then beyond that, um, you know, whatever, whatever time is left, I'll, I'll cover radial heat transfer. Okay. Okay. So let's start with uh, transient conduction. Okay. So this is the most recent, um, you know, recent thing that we covered in, in the class. So this, this just ended just a couple days ago. And transient heat transfer, um, this has to do, oops, transit heat transfer. This has to do with situations, uh, heat transfer situations that change with time, okay? Because up to this point, um, you know, when we were talking about, uh, you know, planar heat conduction, radial heat conduction, and fins, you know, everything we've been covering has been steady state, or there, or time hasn't been a factor at all. Okay, and so in, in transient heat transfer, you know, we are going to start considering time as as a variable, right? And so obviously, this has a lot of, um, you know, really important engineering applications. Anytime where you have a situation where you expect the temperature to change with time, that um, is categorized as transient heat transfer. Okay. So in reality, uh, you know, um, just like a lot of things in this class, you know, the general situation of unsteady heat transfer for, you know, an arbitrary situation, that's a little bit too hard of a, a dip, too difficult of a problem to solve uh, using the methods that we're going over in this class, which is primarily just, you know, pen and paper calculations. But there is, you know, one simplification that we can use or one big assumption in order to solve a lot of these problems by hand. Uh, and that's called the lump capacitance method. And so the idea of the lump capacitance method is, is, you know, you kind of draw the analogy to an electric capacitor, right? right? And so if you kind of remember from your previous circuits classes, either, you know, you took this in physics or, you know, a pre or, you know, the circuits class we have here in the department, uh, you know, a capacitor is a device that can temporarily store flow, right? Or store, uh, store charge. Okay? And so the lump capacitance method kind of draws on this analogy and thinks of objects as, as kind of like thermal capacitors. Okay. But instead of storing charge, what they're um, going to be storing instead is thermal energy, right, or heat. Um, and then through the storage of heat, or, you know, as, as the, you know, as the capacitor here either fills with heat or discharges heat or it releases it, then its temperature is going to change. So generally, you know, if you have more heat in your object, then you're going to have a higher temperature. And as that heat is released, then that temperature is going to go down. All right. Uh, and so this is this is kind of the the idea, right? And so just like a, a capacitor, which can store just a single amount of charge, your your object is also going to be at a singular temperature. Okay. And so this kind of leads us to the key assumption that we have to make with the lump capacitance method. So the key assumption that we have to make is that the object itself, the object in question, 
is um, uniform in temperature. And so all this basically means is that, you know, uh, if you measure the temperature at anywhere in your object, whether it be on the surface or somewhere in the middle of the object, then it should be the same temperature all throughout, okay? Um, and then if you can consider, you know, and the reason, we, the reason we'd make this assumption is if you can assume that the temperature is same all throughout, then we don't have any spatial variability uh, of temperature at all. Okay. And with no spatial variability, there's no there's no reason for us to use any of the methods that we've we've gone up we've used up to this point. So that, whether that be thermal circuits um, or you know the heat equation. Okay. And so we can basically formulate a, a whole new set of equations that that don't rely on space at all. And that's you know that's our um, that's our lump capacitance method. Okay. All right, so the first thing you know I, I want to go over uh, a little bit out of order from you know um, on which we covered it in class is how do we check to see if this assumption is valid? Okay. Because uh, this assumption is not going to be valid for for a lot of objects, and so you know we went over a, a method through which you can you can test to see how how valid this assumption is, and thus if you can if you can use the lump capacitance method, right? And the way that we computed this was we computed what was known as the Biot number. And then the numerical uh, or the variables that are involved in the Biot number are the following. Oops. And so it should be HL over K, right? Where each of these um, variables are labeled as following. So H is our convection coefficient. Okay. L here is some characteristic length. And K, K is the thermal conductivity. Okay. And so it's it's relatively simple, but you know from this we can we can make a lot of conclusions and kind of explain why that you know this Biot number um, can lead us to um, you know the lump capacitance method. Okay? And so in order to apply lump capacitance, what we say is that the Biot number has to be less than 0 0.1, okay? okay? And if you remember from the class, you know, even though that these are, you know, the, the variables that go into the Biot number, kind of what's more important to this is the physical interpretation of it, right? There's so another way that we can express Biot number, just like many non-dimensional numbers that exist out there in engineering, is we can express this as a ratio, right? And so up top, we have the convection coefficient H, right, uh, times L. And so what we can say is that the top of this expression here is like the strength of convection heat transfer. Okay. Or basically how strong, you know, the or, or how strong the amount of heat is uh, coming into your object, okay, from the outside, because remember, convection heat transfer always occurs at the surface of, of an object, right? And so this is a measure of how much external heat is coming in. Okay? And then on in the denominator here, we have um, our thermal conductivity K, and that's almost like a surrogate for conduction heat transfer. Okay. And so by having this requirement that the number has to be less than one, what we're essentially saying is that the denominator here or the amount of conduction heat transfer has to be 10 times greater 
than the convection heat transfer. And so why is this important? And so this is important because, uh, you know, as soon as um, heat enters your object from the outside from convection, in order for the object to be a uniform temperature, any heat that comes in must be immediately conducted through the rest of the object, okay? And so it's all, you can almost think of it like, you know, as, as soon as the heat comes in, then there's like a million, you know, um, little guys ready to carry that heat throughout the object so that whatever heat comes in, it distributes really, really easily, okay? And so some case, so just like we talked about in class, uh, some objects that work really well or tend to work really well with pump capacitance are um, like metals or objects with a high thermal conductivity. Um, because you know, metals, what they'll, what they'll do is that as soon as you change any thermal condition on the outside of it, that heat um, propagates through the metal really, really easily just because it has a high thermal conductivity. And so generally what you'll see is that you know, um, the, the objects that work the best with lump capacitance are the ones with a high uh, thermal conductivity like metals, okay? Okay, and so that's uh, H and K. Let's talk a little bit about L here because you know L can be a little bit tricky to, to compute um, if you don't have a, a specific value, right? And so for L here, the way that we usually compute this, because um, usually you know you're working with um, you know oblong objects um, that don't have a, a specific shape, um, you know what we can do for this is we can take the ratio of the volume of the object divided by its surface area. And so in cases where you have kind of an awkward looking object, you can take this ratio um, and that'll give you a characteristic length. Right? Okay. And so one other thing, you know, before, um, you know, we jump into the lump capacitance method is, um, you know, I want to talk about this, this quantity right here. Okay. And so that quantity is, is known as our time constant. Okay. And it's given by the following expression. So on top we have rho Vc over H A. Okay. And so you know when we go over the, the actual lump capacitance method in a, in, a, in, a, in a second, you know you'll see that this these these groups of terms appear together. Okay. And you know I, I want you to kind of look at these terms you know um, as as a group. Right? And so first we have rho Vc on top, right? So rho being the density, V being the volume, and C being the specific heat uh, or heat capacity. Okay. And so what all these parameters do and the fact that they kind of show up together like the three amigos in, in, the, in, in this equation um, is that all these parameters, they affect how much heat um, or how much, you know, how much heat can be stored into your object. Okay? And so in other words, all of these parameters have to do with thermal storage. Okay. And so if any of those quantities go up, so say the density goes up, the volume goes up, the specific heat goes up, then your object will be, will be able to store um, basically more heat um, inside it, okay? All right, and then on the denominator here, we have H and A, where H is the convection coefficient and A is the surface area, okay? And so the reason these two guys are grouped together is these, these are parameters that affect how much heat um, enters into your, your object. And so if we look at each of them individually, like first we have H, where H is the convection coefficient, um, and A is the surface area, right? And so if you increase the convection coefficient, that increases the rate at which the fluid is able to transfer heat um, to our object, right? And then A, the surface area, 
you know, the more surface area that we have on our object, then, you know, the easier it is for convection heat transfer to occur um, on the inside, okay? All right. And so, you know, I, I wanted to go over those terms because they, they kind of show up together, you know, in the, in the, in, the uh, um, in our expressions, okay? All right. And so with that said, now let's go over the, um, the actual lump capacitance method um, or, you know, the, uh, what you would actually use to solve a lot of these problems. And I'm gonna I'm gonna skip ahead to the general lump capacitance because with general lump capacitance you can you can do um, basically the same thing as like our you know metal in a hot bath or ice cube thing that we did before um, as long as you, as long as you you can apply some assumptions. And so the idea of lump, uh, general lump capacitance here is to um, basically characterize all the different types of heat um, or all the different ways that heat can either um, enter your object or leave the object. With the exception of radiation, because the because uh, radiation again, you know, we're going to save that for for a later time. Okay. And so, if I draw kind of a, a general object here, right, we have actually three um, sources that we um, that we can consider. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Three sources. Right? And so, the first thing we have is uh, we have convection. And so convection is always characterized by the fluid velocity t infinity and also by the convection coefficient h, okay? We also have a, um, in case we're applying a prescribed heat flux, okay? okay. And so, you know, if say we're, we're directly kind of heating an object from, from the outside, right? And so the example that we did for that in class was, you know, like a cast iron skillet, right? And so for a cast iron skillet or anything that you're cooking, if you put it on top of the stove, you can basically apply a direct amount or direct heat flux to your object. Okay? And the last, um, you know, source of heat that we can consider are cases when the object itself can generate its own heat. Right? And we characterize this with the uh, thermal thermal um, generation term Q dot. Okay. okay. And so what the general lump capacitance method will do is it'll, it'll put all of these guys into the same um, equation along with a time derivative of the temperature in order to, uh, you know, uh, characterize the time evolution of, of temperature, right? So let's go ahead and put all of these together. Right? And so the general lump capacitance method basically says that the time rate of change of temperature okay? Okay. this is going to be equal to um, all of the different heat sources that are available in the situation. Uh, or I should say all the heat sources acting on our object. Okay. And so on the left-hand side here, we have, we have to have dt dt, right? Or time derivative of temperature with respect to time, right? And then in order to, uh, to make the units work out, we have to multiply this by um, density times the volume times the um, specific heat. Okay, and remember that was our all of our parameters that have to do with thermal storage. Okay, okay so we have a row VC over there, and on the right hand, and then on the right hand side here we have all of the um, all of the terms. Okay, and so first we have a heat flux term. Right, actually let me color coat the, color coat these to be the same as the other side other page. All right, so first we have our heat flux term. Okay, so this is our prescribed 
it works. Uh, and then we want to convert this actually to a heat transfer rate. Um, and so we don't want to keep it in flux format. And so in order to, to compute a heat transfer rate from heat flux, I'll, <coughs> excuse me, all I have to do is multiply it by an area. And for now, I'll call this area AQ. And so AQ, you can think of it as the, um, the area on which this flux is acting, right? Because usually when you prescribe a heat flux onto something, you're not prescribing it over the entire surface area. So you're only prescribing it on kind of a small, a small section of the, um, of the object, right? And so again, think of our, our pan, right? And so when you put a, a, a frying pan or anything onto a, um, onto a stove, it's only gonna be heating from the place where it's in contact with the stove. And so in that situation, you would plug in like maybe the, the surface area of the bottom of your pan in for AQ. Okay, next we have our thermal generation term. Okay, and so gener thermal generation, remember, represents the amount of heat that the object is producing per unit volume. And since the, uh, since the uh, units for Q dot are usually watts over meters cubed, in order to make this um, you know, work out uh, in terms of units or convert to heat transfer rate, we have to multiply this by the volume. Okay. And so heat flux, we multiply by area, you know, thermal generation, we multiply by volume. And the last thing we have is Q convection. Where Q convection here is, um, you know, we're going to use um, Newton's law of cooling for this. Okay. And so Newton's law of cooling, if you remember, is, is the following. So we have Q convection is equal to H times A T minus T infinity. Right. And so we can just go ahead and plug that right into our um, general lump capacitance formula. Right? Right. Um, but before we do that, let's let's make one substitution to, to help simplify the math. Right? And so since we have our convection term here with t minus t infinity, you know, this happens. This this always seems to occur whenever we have um, any situation with convection. Um, and you'll and you know we'll see this again later once we once we review um, fins. And so just to simplify the math for us, so we don't have an extra T infinity floating around, what we usually do is we define what's called the excess temperature. Okay. And so the excess temperature is, is given by the following. So we usually define it with the variable theta. And we say that theta is equal to T minus T infinity. Uh, and then in addition to this, uh, what we have is, um, you know, we can take the derivative of um, theta, okay? And so we take d theta dt, okay? Um, since t infinity here is just a constant, when we take the derivative of that, it just goes away, right? And so what we get is d theta dt is equal to dt dt, okay? I just realized too that this is a, traditionally it's, it's a minus sign because this is, you know, we assume that heat transfer by convection is going out. Okay. okay, and so we can put all this together and we can get the uh, final expression for our general lump capacitance. Okay. And so putting it all together, what we have is d theta dt. Okay. Uh, and so that's, that's our time derivative term plus um, HA all over rho Vc times theta. Right, so that's our convection term, which I had moved to the left-hand side, right? Notice also that I divided the entire equation by rho Vc, okay? So that's why you don't see anything in front of the time derivative, but you, see, you do see denominator for the convection term. Okay? Next, we have our prescribed heat flux term. So our prescribed heat flux term will be Q naught um, double prime, Uh, multiplied by AQ divided by rho VC, okay? And then finally, what we have here is our thermal generation. So we have Q dot over rho C. 
All right, so this right here is our general lump capacitance um, method, okay? All right, so usually, usually, you know, when you're solving these problems, you're not gonna solve for this entire, you're not gonna solve for every single term here, okay? Because um, usually most situations don't have everything here going on. And so the first step in, um, in these lump capacitance problems is to always apply your assumptions based on what's, you know, what's been said in the problem and cancel out some terms. And so once you do that, then you'll be able to uh, simplify your math uh, quite a bit usually. Okay. All right. And another thing, uh, another thing I'll note too is that you know a lot of the um, problems that that have to do that involve convection, uh, a lot of times you're going to have to solve a, a first order differential equation. Okay. And so another thing I'll remind you is you know go back through your your previous notes from you know your ODE's class, whether that be you know Math 250A or 308. And kind of just review, you know, how do you solve, you know, general first order equations, right? And so there's there's a few methods. So the most simplest, if it's available to you, is to do a separation of variables. And so that's the case when you have a separable equation. Um, but otherwise, you can use methods like integrating factor. You can use characteristic equations and and all that stuff. Okay. All right. And so let's let's do an example here just to kind of illustrate this. So this so this is an example that's in the lecture notes. Uh, but we didn't get to it because uh, you know we kind of just ran out of time. So let's uh, let's let's do that. And if this is an example that incorporates the thermal generation term, uh, which which we haven't we actually haven't used yet in, in here. Okay. All right. And so for this term, let's let's consider a, a, a you know a, a very popular commercial item. Uh, and you know if if you've done it, ever done any hiking in in you know very cold places, you're you're probably familiar with this. And, these, and this item is known as a hand warmer. Okay. And so the thing with the hand warmer is that uh, is it's it's basically a, a little packet that's about this it's about the size of your hand and so you should you know it's designed for you to be able to grip it and then either by you know electricity or by you know some chemical reaction this thing is going to be generating heat in order to warm your your hand. So usually what you do is you put it underneath, um, you know, you may you maybe put it underneath your glove or maybe if you're trying to warm your chest, you put it underneath your clothes, right? And so it's it's a it's a really nice device to kind of help you retain body heat, which is you know really important when you're doing those those you know cold hikes. Okay. And so um, visually, you know, I'm I'm just gonna draw it just like this, right? So I'm gonna draw it as a rectangle, right? And then if you add this to your hand or you apply it to your hand, okay. It's my little scary Edward scissor hands or whatever, okay. All right, if you uh, apply this to there, then you get basically warm, warm hands. Okay. And it does this by generating heat. Okay, so let's, let's consider a situation where our hand warmer, we're going to be putting it underneath um, a glove or something or underneath, you know, um, maybe, maybe your, uh, maybe your sweater or maybe underneath your shirt. Okay. Okay. And so schematically, the situation looks like like this, right? So maybe let's say that this is the the um, outer surface of your glove. Okay, and so we're looking at the glove kind of at, um, from a straight on view, right? On one side you have your hand, okay, and so again, you know, this is a, a head on view. Okay, and then right next to the hand, what we have is our hand warmer. Okay, so the hand warmer is basically right next to our our hand. And since you know, since we're doing this on, under this situation, so we're basically shielding the hand warmer with clothes in order to insulate it. Then you know, um, there's going to be no heat loss due to convection. Okay. 
um, because in order for there to be convection, then your object has to be exposed to, um, you know, to the outside winds. But in this case, we don't have that because we're, we're basically shielding it with, with our clothes, okay? In addition to this, you know, the, we're, we're not applying any warming, any additional warming to the hand warmer, okay? So we can basically assume that the prescribed heat flux um, is zero. Okay. Actually, no, actually let's, uh, sorry, I misread the problem, okay? And so there is going to be a heat flux here, but the heat flux is actually gonna be out from the, um, from the hand warmer, okay? And because as the hand warmer generates heat, what's gonna happen is that your skin or your hand is going to absorb that heat. Okay. And what we can model that with is, we can model it with a, um, you know, as a heat flux, okay? And so basically we can model this, since it's gonna be a loss of heat from the hand warmer, we can model it with a negative uh, heat flux. Okay? So we can say, you know, we have a prescribed heat flux of minus Q skin double prime, okay? Okay, and so what we have is a situation with no convection, uh, but we do have thermal generation. So let's say that the thermal generation is gonna be Q dot, okay? And we do have a prescribed heat flux, a negative heat flux of minus Q skin, okay? And so let's apply this to our lump capacitance method and simplify it and then solve for the, um, you know, solve for the temperature, okay? Okay. All right, and so the starting point for any transient problem is always going to be the lump capacitance method, right? And so here, since we have thermal generation and also heat flux, we're gonna start with general lump capacitance. Okay. And so with general lump capacitance, um, we don't have any convection here. So instead of theta, you know, we, we can't define our excess temperature without any, uh, without any convection or fluid temperature. And so I'm just going to use the form of the equation with just T, okay? All right, so our general lump capacitance looks like this. So we have dT dt plus HA over rho Vc T is equal to HA over rho Vc T infinity plus Q dot over rho C plus Q S double prime or Q naught um, A Q divided by rho V C, okay? Okay, and so let's assume that we, we have everything, we know everything else about the, uh, the hand warmer. So we know its density, we know its volume, we know its specific heat, uh, we know its surface area, um, you know, and that's, that's everything that we need, okay? All right. So let's go ahead and cancel these terms. And so these are our convection terms. Uh, but in this problem, we've already established that we don't have any convection. Okay. And so what we're left with is a, a bunch of constants. Okay. But before we do that, let's go ahead and plug in for Q not double prime, because in this problem, we know that the heat flux is going to be minus. Right? So it's going to be minus Q. Um, skin double prime. All right, so plugging all those things in, we have dt, dt is equal to q naught over rho c minus q skin double prime a sub q divided by rho v c, okay? Okay, and so at this point, what we can do is simply integrate because everything on the right-hand side of this equation, they're all constants. Okay. okay. And so if we simply integrate both sides with respect to T, what we get is T of T is equal to Q dot over rho C minus 
Q skin, double prime, AQ divided by rho VC, T plus C, okay? Uh, and so C here is our arbitrary constant. Uh, and to solve for that, we have to apply our initial conditions. And so in this problem, we weren't given any initial conditions, but let's just say that we, uh, we knew um, the initial temperature of the heat of the of the of the hand warmer, right? Usually, this is not a bad assumption because you know usually you're out hiking and your hand warmer is probably going to start at the same temperature of whatever it is outside. Okay, and so let's assume T of zero is equal to T naught. Okay, and so we plug that in. What we get is C is equal to T naught. And then our final answer for T of T is gonna be Q dot over rho C minus Q skin double prime A sub Q rho V C T plus T naught, okay? And so for this problem, you know, the, the initial temperature and, and you know, the value of C is, is not that, um, you know, usually is not that important here. But what I wanted to show you more was to, you know, how do you start from general lump capacitance and what do you cross out? Um, and in, for a situation which we don't have convection, which is, you know, we haven't seen that yet, how do we actually deal with the, uh, um, you know, how do we actually deal with the integral, okay? All right, so obviously, you know, if you do have convection here, which is the case in a, in a lot of, um, you know, cases, um, this integral become, or this, uh, the solution to this differential equation becomes a lot more complex. Um, but remember, in those cases, you can use whatever technique for ODE solving that you, um, that you know. All right, and so that's everything I want to talk about on transient heat conduction. And so now let's move on to fins. Okay. All right, so we spent you know, quite a bit of time talking about fins, um, and, you know, we, and we kind of went through you know, a lot of different things. Um, but in essence, you know, a fin is, uh, is a structure that, you, that, that you know, engineers usually design or they put on their devices um, to increase the amount of convection heat transfer that comes that comes from the object. Another name for these fins is extended surfaces. And so you'll see you'll see fins in a lot of applications where you know we have to offload a lot of heat, uh, and so these are um, situations like um, you know like for a computer, uh, or it could be like a situation like like an engine where you know the object or the device is producing too much heat, and in order to make sure that the device doesn't melt itself or it doesn't you know over overload, um, then you know fins are constructed to help kind of offload that heat into the environment. Okay. Um, and the reason it does this, and the reason you know fins are effective, is that they essentially, um, you know, they essentially increase the surface area of your object. Okay. Because uh, remember, you know, most objects lose their heat to the environment through convection, right? And so either, you know, blow air over the object or you know, blow water or, or some kind of fluid. Um, and, you know, all of any, any heat transfer that gets lost from the object to, you know, the fluid, all this occurs at the surface. And so if you could increase the surface area of your object, then, you know, that's naturally going to increase your amount of convection heat transfer because that's basically more places or more area for your object to lose heat, okay? And so fins basically, you know, serve that purpose. Um, because you know, structurally and mechanically, you know, they're they're very simple structures, right? So the one that we've always kind of used um, in the class is one that just looks like a beam that kind of sticks out from from an object. Right? Okay, and so this is kind of the most basic fin, um, you know, that we can think of, where you have your object and you have just like you know a, a structure that kind of juts out from it. Okay, and so if you compare this to you know maybe the same wall of the object without any 
um, without any fin sticking out, you can see that you know the one on the left there is going to have an increased surface area uh, because it's just naturally you know longer and, and bigger than than the one on the on the right. Okay, and so that's that's all fins are basically. So fins are just you know objects that increase the um, the surface area. Okay, and so what I want you guys to focus on when you're when you're studying fins um, is you know what are some factors that make a good fin. Because, uh, you know, more likely than not, you know, if, if you go out and you work on something like electronic design or you work on engines or something like that, you're going to be building a fin in, in some way or form, right? Or, you, you know, you work with radiators and, and things like that. Because uh, fins are just, you know, they're just fundamental objects that just increase um, surface area for better heat transfer, okay? And so it's, you know, it's, it's unavoidable. Fins, fins are kind of a, a fundamental part of heat transfer. Um, and, you know, the, the exact fin, you know, and, you know, there's... There's no fin design out there that's absolutely perfect, right? So there's no holy fin design. Because um, a lot of times, you know, you're going to be constrained by a lot of other things too, like, you know, material costs or maybe the, the silhouette of the object or, you know, the maximum volume or surface area. Um, and so what I want you guys to, to pick up from this, this section, you know, not only for this midterm, but for beyond is, you know, what are some aspects of good fins or what are, what are some things that make a fin really, really effective? Okay. Okay. And so let's let's talk about some of these um, some of these factors. Okay. All right. And so the first thing I want to talk about is um, you know the fin uh, the fin differential equation. Okay. Okay. So the fin differential equation was given by the following. And so the fin differential equation was d squared theta dx squared minus h um, p over k a c times theta is equal to zero. Okay. And so you know contrast this with our lump capacitance method because you can see now that we have a derivative in terms of space, right? And so you don't have time that shows up here at all. We just have x, which is the space. Okay. All right, and so in particular, I want to look at this variable right here because this variable right here is going to affect, you know, how how effective your fin is going to be. Okay, uh, because if you if you solve this differential equation, um, you know, um, you basically move this over to the right, and you, uh, um, or well, I guess in this case you'd have to use the characteristic equation. And the solution to this equation is going to be theta of x is equal to c1 e to the um, square root of hp over kac x plus c2 e to the minus hp over kac x. Okay. And so you can see here that you know this this quantity of HP over KAC you know has a big impact on the um, on the results. Okay, right. And if you recall from the class, you know the way that we typically solve this was we you know we had to apply two boundary conditions to solve for C one and C two. Okay. Okay. And so the first boundary condition that we usually specify. Is that uh, we know is that we know the uh, the base temperature, right? And so theta of zero is equal to theta b. Okay, and so all this basically states here is that that we know the base temperature. Okay. And then the other boundary condition was the boundary condition at the tip, and so you know remember we have four different varieties here for the uh, for the tip. Um, but the one that, you know, I, I want to talk about um, in particular, because it's the one that kind of simplifies our math the most, is um, we assume that um, at the tip of our fin, 
it reaches the same temperature as the fluid, okay? Okay, and so mathematically we can say that theta as x approaches infinity is equal to zero, okay? And in order for that to happen, we can't have a term with a positive exponential, right? So if we kept that C1 term there, we have e, we basically have e to the infinity and e to the infinity is infinity. And so in order for this to be satisfied, we can basically cross this guy out, okay? And then we're left with just a decaying exponential term right here, okay? Okay. All right. And so, you know, um, basically, you know, how, how the temperature decays from this um, decaying exponential is going to determine a lot of its uh, performance, okay? And so let's uh, and so let's let's talk about that uh, quite a bit, okay? And so if we if we graph this um, this temperature distribution, what we get is the following. Okay. And so um, you know decaying exponential is going to start at theta b up on the left hand side, and then it's going to decay down just like that, okay? Right. And generally, you know, remember that we um, you know, the heat transfer that we have here in a fin is heat transfer from convection, right? And so, um, you know, convection heat transfer, you know, not only depends on H, but it also depends on the temperature difference between your object and the fluid, okay? And so basically in areas where we have a higher temperature difference, then, you know, we're gonna have enhanced heat transfer. I should say maybe areas with higher excess temperature. Um, areas with higher excess temperature have um, enhanced heat transfer. And this is what we want, right? Because the, the whole point of the fin is to increase the amount of heat transfer that, that occurs from the fin, right? And so if you can have um, basically places where, um, you know, you have, um, you know, more, um, you know, more heat transfer and that's persistent along the fin, okay? That's going to be, um, that's gonna be desirable. Right. And so taking, taking that into account, uh, what we basically want is, you know, in order for our fin to be effective is we want the fin or the, the temperature distribution in the fin to basically decay slowly, right? And so something like this would be more desirable, right? And so say that we had a decay that looks like that. And so, you know, the decay doesn't happen quickly, right? And so you can see here from that green curve that the temperature difference or the excess temperature stays high, right? Compared to the black one. And so this would be a much more effective fin because what you have here is enhanced heat transfer kind of all throughout the, the fin, okay? Versus a case where you have something that looks like this, okay? And so in the red right there, what we see is that the temperature decays, you know, almost immediately. And so for all of these areas here where we have basically no temperature difference, we're basically getting no heat transfer because we just, there's just no temperature difference between the fin and the fluid, okay? And so an effective fin will basically, you know, keep that temperature difference really high and thus, you know, the exponential decay is, is slower, okay? And so let's look at, let's look at that exponential decay term, right? And so if we come back here, you know, the, the decay rate is given by what's in that decay, what is what's given in front of the x value here, right? And so what we have is state of x is equal to 
theta b, which is our base temperature, e to the minus h, um, h times p over k a c, okay, x, okay, okay. And so basically, um, you know, quantities that will uh, that will increase this uh, or decrease that that coefficient there will help to uh, make the heat transfer more effective. Okay, and so in particular, I, I want to um, talk about this uh, variable k here, right? Because k here is the thermal conductivity of our our fin. Right? And so what this tells you is that since k is in the denominator here, um, you know, in order to make an effective fin. The K should be, you know, a lot higher. Okay, so higher thermal conductivity uh, means better fit. And so if you choose, you know, the way that we choose our thermal conductivity is we, is we choose our materials, right? And so, um, you know, if you choose a material with a high thermal conductivity, this will be, you know, this will, this will ultimately, ultimately be, be a good thing, okay? Okay. And so that's, you know, one way that you can interpret the temperature, um, you know, distribution in terms of effectiveness. Uh, but there's also, you know, uh, there's actually, you know, um, we actually went over how to um, compute fin, uh, fin performance in terms of two, uh, two variables, right? Okay. Right, and so fin performance, um, you know, we had, we had two, uh, we had two, um, variables here, right? So the first, the first one that we had was a fin effectiveness. Okay. And so fin effectiveness is given by this, okay? Uh, where QF here, QF is the uh, amount of heat transfer that's being um, lost through the fin, okay? Okay. And so that's, that's basically, you know, how much heat transfer is, uh, is coming out from your fin already, okay? Um, and if you remember, you know, the way that we can compute this for, uh, for a given fin is to compute the amount of heat transfer that happens at the base of our fin, okay? Okay, because remember what the, the argument that we made is that any heat that gets lost from the fin, you know, from the exterior surface of the fin, it has to pass through the base at some point, right? And so if we compute the amount of heat transfer at the base, that will tell us, you know, how much, um, you know, heat transfers, heat, how much heat is being lost overall, right? And so basically the way that we can compute this is that QF is going to be equal to, right? Uh, and here we're going to use Fourier's law, right? So Fourier's law means that... Uh, heat transfer rate is equal to minus K AC um, times D theta DX, okay? Evaluate it at X is equal to zero because that's where, that's where the base is, okay? And so usually in order to compute your effectiveness, the first thing you have to solve for is theta, okay? And so you have to basically solve for this function right here for, for theta and then take its derivative and then plug it in, in here, okay? And so that's the numerator. In the denominator here, what we have is HAC times theta B, right? And so what that quantity is, is that's the amount of heat transfer that you would occur, that would occur in that same region of space if the fin was not there, okay? OK, 
Okay. Um, and so you can almost think of it as like, you know, you have a little patch of space on your, on your object, right? That looks like this. Okay. And normally, you know, you have, you would have a fin jutting out here with the cross-sectional area AC, right? And so if you look at that cross-sectional area, you know, on the, on the object with an area of AC, right? This quantity right here, H times AC times theta B, you know, essentially what that is, is just Newton's law of heat transfer um, or Newton's law of cooling um, you know, for that small patch of, of space, okay, right? And so what you have here for effectiveness is a ratio, right? And so it's basically a ratio of the amount of heat transfer that you actually get from the fin versus how much heat transfer that you would get if the fin was not there, okay? And so in other words, you can almost think of effectiveness as, as you know, um, as the amount of, as the amount that the fin is enhancing heat transfer, okay? And so ideally what you would want is you would want effectiveness to be some high number, right? And so the threshold I think that we talked about in class was two, okay? And so if you have an effectiveness of two, what you're, what you're saying is that, you know, the fin is um, outputting twice as much heat um, as if, you know, the fin wasn't there, right? And so that's usually a good threshold, but, you know, uh, exact numbers for, for you know, effectiveness is going to depend on, um, you know, your application, okay? Okay. And so, um, you know, for, uh, for the simple tip condition that we had, where we assumed that the fin was really long, we were able to compute, actually compute um, a, um, an expression for um, effectiveness, okay? Okay. And so for a really long fin, what we get is effectiveness is equal to square root of Kp over HAC, okay, right? And so uh, again, you know, we want higher, higher numbers of effectiveness because that's going to make our fin, you know, um, enhance heat transfer more. And so what we can do is we can look at this um, expression here and look at, you know, the variables that, um, that contribute to a high value of effectiveness, right? And so first let's look at um, thermal conductivity K and so we did, we just got done talking about this, right? And so what we mentioned before was that, you know, a higher value of K meant that the temperature distribution would decay slower, right? Or in other words, more of the fin would be the same temperature uh, as the base, right? Because the temperature is going to decay slower. Right? And that, and that, you know, uh, and that interpretation here is confirmed by this expression for effectiveness, right? And so, you know, what this basically says is that higher K means higher effectiveness. Okay. Intuitively, you can almost think of it like this. And like this is, I think this is a good conversation to have, you know, now that we're done talking about lump capacitance methods, right? And so remember with lump capacitance, you know, one of the assumptions that we had to make or one condition that makes makes it so that we can um, apply our lump capacitance method was that the thermal conductivity has to be high in order for the BOT number to be low, right? And so remember what we said back then was that you know if you have an object with a high value of K, then any any heat that enters from the outside gets conducted through the object really really quickly, right? And so for fin, it's the same way. And so for, for a fin, if you have an if you have it's if it's made of a material with a high thermal conductivity. Then any heat that that you know um, any heat that that comes in from the base of the fin is going to conduct through the fin really easily. And then once the once that heat conducts through the fin, it's much more easily lost to the to the fluid. Okay. And so you know materials with high K you know um, are going to be good a, a good for a lot of our methods in this case. So they make you know they make it so that we can apply our lump capacitance method and they make for effective fins as well. All right. And so the next thing I, I want to talk about is P over AC, right? And so this has to do with the geometry. And so you can almost think of this as like the aspect ratio of the uh, of our fin cross section, right? And so this is this was the homework problem, right? Okay. And what we saw in the homework was that, you know, if you have a fin cross section that's relatively thin, or in other words, something with, you know, a higher perimeter relative to its cross sectional area, 
then this is going to make for an effective fit, right? Um, and intuitively, you know, the, the reason this is, is, you know, the thinner that your fin is, or the more surface area that it has, you know, much more easily um, than um, that's going to be, that's going to be much more easy, easy for the convection heat transfer to occur, right? Because if you have something that's round, like, like a, like a circle, right, you're going to have heat that's in the middle of that circle. That's, it's, it's going to kind of struggle to get out of the, uh, out of the, um, you know, out of the fin because it's kind of stuck in the middle, right? And so you want to kind of limit the amount of spaces where heat can kind of get stuck. And so if you have a thin geometry right here, you know, there's kind of really nowhere for the heat to go for, but to go out, right? Because if you have a heat, you know, if you have, you know, like a, like an, like a part of your object kind of right in the middle here, okay, then that heat can either go up or go down. And it's a very short path um, for it to travel um, to go from inside the fin to out into the fluid, okay? And so if you have, you know, a, a high aspect ratio or a high, you know, perimeter to cross-sectional area ratio, then this is going to lead to, you know, more effectiveness. All right, so the last one that we have here is H, okay? And remember, H here is the convection coefficient, okay? And so convection coefficient, remember, this is kind of a strange one because, uh, you know, convect, usually, you know, you would expect that the better um, that your fluid is at transferring heat, then you're, then, you know, that's, that's a good thing because your fin is going to lose more and more heat, right? Because okay. high values of H, and, you know, and we'll start talking about this next week, high values of H basically indicate that the fluid is really good at transferring heat. And so this is kind of paradoxical because, you know, how can, how can we say that, you know, if we have a better fluid or a higher H, how does that lead to a less effective fin? Um, and the reason for that is, is kind of the, it, it kind of, it's kind of comes back to this interpretation of, of effectiveness, right? Because remember, effectiveness is the ratio between uh, how much heat is being lost from the fin versus how much heat that would be lost, you know, if, if that fin wasn't there, okay? If you increase the, if you increase the amount of heat transfer from the fluid, um, what that does, it, it, it kind of helps both situations, right? And so you, you, you make the fluid better and it improves the fin situation, but it also improves the situation without the fin as well, right? So it, it improves this guy too, right? And so, you know, basically what this is saying is that the better your fluid is at transferring heat, then it becomes kind of less worth it to, to build the fin, right? And so, you know, let's, let's take it to the extreme. So let's say that you have, you know, a, a fluid with an extremely high H. So let's say it's like liquid mercury or something like that. Okay. Uh, and so because the liquid mercury is already so good at transferring heat and taking heat away from your object, it kind of becomes like, you know, you can build a fin, um, but it really, it's not really going to be worth it because, you know, the liquid, the liquid mercury um, already is transferring the heat so, so well. Um, and so that's why you see H in the, de in the denominator thing. Okay. And so it's, it's, it's not that H, you know, it's not that a higher H is a bad thing. Um, a higher H is always going to be good because that's going to help you transfer more heat to the fluid. Um, it's, it's just that, you know, the higher your H is, it just becomes less worth it um, to, to build your fin, okay? Okay, and so that's effectiveness. And so let's go over just one more, um, uh, one more, um, you know, parameter before we, uh, we end this um, review session, okay? And that is the efficiency. All right, and so efficiency has this symbol right here. So it looks like a, the, the exact name for it is eta. Um, and then it's given by this expression, right? And so in the numerator up there, we have QF, where uh, QF has the same definition as before. So this is the, uh, you know, uh, amount of heat transfer from the fin, okay? And then in the denominator, we have something that looks very similar to fin effectiveness, okay? Um, but with one kind of key difference here, okay? Instead of um, taking the cross-sectional area of the base, what this AF right here is, is the total surface area of your entire fin, okay? Okay. And so what this efficiency basically um, measures is on top, you know, it's efficiency is also going to be a ratio here. And on the top, we have the heat transfer from the fin. 
And on the bottom here, we have uh, what you kind of think of it as the theoretical maximum um, heat transfer that's possible from the fin. And so I say theoretical because in reality, this is um, almost impossible to get. So you, you can get pretty close depending on, you know, how you design your fin, uh, but it's, it's, it's impossible to get that, right? And so, you know, what is this maximum um, heat transfer or, or under what conditions do we, do we get it, right? And so if you look at this expression here, it, it looks like, you know, Newton's law of cooling again, um, but, you know, um, and our temperature difference here is state of B. So that's gonna be, you know, the temperature difference at the base which is the maximum temperature difference that you see in the fin, okay? The fact that we're multiplying this by AF, which is the total surface area, means that the, um, the theoretical maximum heat transfer from the fin occurs when the entire fin is at the same temperature. Okay. And so this goes back to, you know, what we were talking about before when we were looking at the temperature, at the temperature distributions in the fin, right? And so the best situation would be if the temperature didn't decay at all. And so, you know, if the entire fin stayed at theta B, then what would happen is that, you know, everywhere along the fin, you would have like the biggest temperature difference possible, which leads, you know, to the most heat transfer, okay? Uh, and so in reality, you know, we, we know that doesn't happen because as you go along the fin, the temperature is always going to decrease, okay? Um, but, you know, if you were able to design a fin where it's the same temperature all throughout, this is the best possible situation, okay? And that's why that's in the, in the denominator there, right? And so this efficiency will take the ratio in between, um, you know, what you actually get from the fin versus the theoretical max. And so efficiency here will always be a number between zero and one, okay? Whereas efficiency values that are closer to one are a good thing, right? And so that means that your fin um, is being very, very efficient. Okay. All right. And so again, you know, for the fin, uh, for the fin problems, uh, you know, what I want you guys to really focus on in your studying is, you know, what are some factors that make a really, really good fin? Okay. And, you know, you can base a lot of those arguments on, you know, um, kind of what we talked about at the end here, which is the fin effectiveness and the fin, um, and the fin efficiency. Okay. Okay. And so I think it's been uh, almost about an hour, 10 minutes now. And so I think, you know, I think that's, um, you know, I think that's, that's good for this review session, right? Uh, and so I didn't get a chance to get to radial heat transfer. Uh, but if you do have any questions on that, definitely uh, reach out, okay? Uh, so up until the midterm, you know, I'll be available as much as I can. So, you know, don't be, don't be afraid to reach out. I'm always happy to, to answer questions, even up to, you know, five minutes before the midterm, okay? And so best of luck to start um, in your studying, everyone. Um, and I'll see you for the exam on Wednesday.